Hi everybody, um, my name's Eva. I'm currently on a kickstart with Regenda and um, the Learning Foundry and I'm going to be hosting this call with Irina Hall. Um, she is the former police detective, um, motivational speaker and a business owner. Um, I just want to say a quick thing before we actually start, this session is going to be recorded so um, if you know anybody who would um, like to watch it afterwards because they couldn't attend today, it's absolutely fine. Um, or if you just want to re-watch it, that's absolutely fine as well, it'll be on our YouTube channel and um, also if we could just stay on mute um, just so there's as less background noise as possible that would be great and at the end there'll be a chance to ask any questions if you don't feel comfortable enough to take yourselves off mute or in um, camera there's a little text box that you're well, very welcome to pop the question into and I can read it out for you or I can just read it um, but yeah so Irene you can go ahead um, it's all yours <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hello, hello to Hannah and hello everybody. Uh, my name's Irene Affle and um, I am, as was said, a business owner. I run a coaching and consultancy company. But before I start talking about that, I'll talk to you a little bit about my background and my history and the careers that I've had in the past because I'm currently on my third career. So um, I grew up in Liverpool, um, mostly in Toxteth, South Liverpool. Um, came from um, a very poor background um, in terms of my mum was a single parent, so we didn't have much growing up. Um, we, well, in fact, we hardly had anything growing up, but there you go. But we had lots of love and lots of family around us, which was the most important thing. Went to school, passed me 11 plus, and I went to school in uh, Walton, which is in South Liverpool. Notre Dame, as it was called then, it's now changed to St. Julie's. But while I was there, it was called Notre Dame, Notre Dame High School in Walton, and it used to be a school for debutantes. So there you go, a bit of history. Um, went there, loved school, absolutely loved school, really excelled at school. I was really competitive, so I always wanted to be top of the class. I always wanted to be, you know, the best in the group. So I worked really, really hard at school, did lots, you know, did all my homework. I was a bit of a teacher's pet, really. Um, <laughs> but I had a great circle of friends and I just had fun in school. We had a really good time, good laugh, learning and having fun. Um, I did leave school at 16, um, much against the wishes of my mum and also my teachers who were saying, no, you need to go onto A-levels and you need to go to university because I was very gifted in the sciences, maths, chemistry, biology, physics. Um, and people had sort of hopes for me to be in the medical profession and have a medical career. And I was quite interested in that myself. I was interested in pharmacy and also being a radiographer at that time. That was what I was thinking of. But I needed to bring money in and I wanted to, to start earning money because I wanted my independence. So um, during the summer, after I'd finished school, done, your, done all my O-levels, during that summer, I started applying for jobs, any job. and you know, that I could get my hands on. Didn't get any jobs, so I ended up going back to school and starting my A-levels. So I was doing maths, chemistry and biology, heading for a scientific career. Then I got a job offer, working for the local authority for the Liverpool City Council, just as a clerk, as an admin clerk. But it, for me, it was like, yes, a job, money, I can get me independence. And I said to myself that I could educate myself you know further along the line I could do like you know night classes I could do day release college which is what I did do so I did stop me stop um, me A levels left school and started working for the local authority and as I say I started off as a clerk and as I progressed I started to specialize in law and I moved into the legal department first of all investigating claims against council you know where people trip over or you know, they have an accident, that's the council's fault. And I started off investigating those, which is really interesting. We've got to go out and do site inspections and take photographs of the scene and everything. Little did I know that that was about to set me up for a career in the police, but there you go. <laughs> so love that work. And then I moved into child protection and um, working in um, these, working in the child protection field. So we dealt with cases, uh, care proceedings and, and wardship cases, which again was a, a real eye opener for me. And just like sort of learning about the, you know, the difficulties that some families um, 
have to endure and some children have to endure and it really ignited a passion in me to want to do this kind of work so it was from that role that I actually met a couple of police officers a couple of detectives who worked in that um, on the criminal side of, of um, child protection and they were really nice and they were really down to earth the experiences that I had of police officers growing up, because I grew up in Toxteth and I was living in Toxteth through the Toxteth riots, was that they were racist and violent and I really didn't like police officers. I was racially abused by them as a child growing up and I really was quite fearful of the police. And so meeting these two officers who seemed really normal and down to earth and I was thinking, oh gosh, it can't all be that bad. Um, so those, these two guys, <laughs> one of them was saying, have you ever thought of joining the police? And I was like, not a chance absolutely not not for me not a career I would even ever consider um, and they said well I think you'd be a really good detective and I was like no 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 and this went on for a while and it was just a bit of banter between us and a laugh and a joke and stuff and in the end they actually got me an application form and said just fill it in and just see how you get on so in order to just get them off my case I thought oh, go on I'll fill it in filled it in sent it off and then next minute I get called for um, the entrance exam. So I did the entrance exam, passed it with flying colours because I'm quite academic, so, <laughs> and they're quite competitive. And then um, it was a medical, physical number of interviews. And, and I just went through the process because I didn't think I was going to get in. Then I, next minute I get um, the letter of congratulations, you are now being invited to be a police officer and this is your start date. And I was just like, oh my goodness. What do you do now? <laughs> you know, it was a real dilemma because on the one hand, I loved the job that I was doing with the city council, but on the other hand, it was a new challenge and it was more money as well. And we would have meant that I could buy my own property or at least get on the property ladder. So I thought, well, I can always uh, go back to me law exams. I was studying law at the time. I was doing a legal executives course. I could always continue with that or I may as well just have a look and see what it's like, you know, at the end of the day and see. And if I don't like it, I could always fall back on my previous career because back then you could always get a job in the council once you'd been in there. It was quite easy to get back in. So I took a chance, took a leap of faith and I joined uh, the police um, and it was a surreal experience. It was a it was a wonderful experience in many ways. The training was was fantastic because I'm quite into me fitness and it was loads and loads of fitness training there was great facilities at the, the training school for you know doing your fitness and doing running and things like that absolutely loved it loved the camaraderie of it absolutely loved the training and then gets to the station where I was posted and I was posted to a station in North Liverpool called Lower Lane which is in um Fazakali Norris Green and Croxteth so covering that north end of the city and it was a baptism of fire for me because I got there and I was like, oh my goodness, there's nobody here that looks like me, either in the station or outside of the station. So I was a bit of a target um, for young people in the community, you know, calling me racist names and things like that. And also being on the end of a bit of racist and sexist banter in the police because I was the only woman on my section as well um, and yet yeah, the only black person for as far as the eye could see so it was quite a, a different environment for me and it was a struggle to sort of get used to it and to get adjusted to it but I did because I had some great colleagues even though there were some you know not so nice colleagues I had a, a circle of really fantastic colleagues and I loved the job I loved serving the community I absolutely loved it so for me it was just like yeah, you just get on with it, get your head down, work hard. And that's what I did. And feeling ambitious, because I am ambitious, I wanted to get promoted. So I did study for the promotion exams for the sergeants and inspectors exams, and I did get promoted. And it was hard work, you know, it wasn't easy. I'd come home from after a 10 hour shift and then I'd get the books out and I'd be studying for about three or four hours, you know, and I was doing that four or five times a week. And it was exhausting, but I was determined to get through. Because you, you don't get anywhere without hard work and I knew I had to work hard to get through the exam because the exam was quite difficult and I knew I had to work hard to build a, re a good reputation for myself so that when if I did pass the exam I would be a suitable person to get promoted because they could see I'm a hard worker and I'm a good worker 
So I did pass the exams and I did get promoted to sergeant and I was really, really proud of that. Got me stripes on my shoulders and it was a great um, achievement for me. But I didn't want to stop there. I did my sergeant's role for about five years and loved that. Worked a bit in child protection, did a lot of uh, patrol work, general patrol work, worked in professional standards, which is looking at police officers who are being naughty. Um, and, you know, sort of getting them out of trouble and, and dealing with the ones who were, you know, corrupt or doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And that was a really interesting role as well. So I did a very, quite a varied role there, a very varied, yeah, lots of different things when I was a sergeant. And then I did my inspector's exam and got promoted to inspector after, I think, five years as a sergeant. And what I didn't know at the time, but since found out, was that I became the first black female inspector in the history of Merseyside Police and I didn't even know because I was I just assumed there must have been lots before me but when I looked around the force and I you know, looked at the ranks and I thought actually there isn't <laughs> there's not many people who look like me who are in rank in fact there weren't any um, of rank except for myself so it was just like oh wow this has got to change and that kind of ignited my passion then for um, driving equality and diversity, because I thought, you know, we're a police service, we serve the community, we serve lots and lots of different types of communities, a very diverse community, and we don't look like them, we don't reflect them, and therefore, how can we understand them? So that started me then on a sort of passion for getting more minorities and uh, minority groups into the police, and I did develop a, a leadership programme. Um, which was a, like a pre-recruitment programme and I took it into the black community and said like we need more black people to join the police and because I was from that community and people knew me, knew of my family and um, there was a, an element of trust there so you know and I was like look I've done it, I've joined and I've you know been able to progress and we need more people so we can have a force that reflects the community and serves the community in the right way because they understand the cultural issues and understand community issues so, um, so yeah, took that into the community and we got um, applications from people from lots of different minority groups. In fact, it wasn't just ethnic minorities, it was more women we needed. We need, needed more people from the LGBTQ plus community, people with a disability who could do different varying roles within the police service. So it was trying to bring everybody in and it was a really successful programme, which I ran for, I think, just up to two years. And we ran three cohorts and managed to recruit a lot of diverse um, officers into the organization. And I was so proud of that, really, really proud of that. Um, so yeah, loved my career, seen lots of things, done lots of things, worked as a detective, worked on the um, murder investigation team, worked on you know sexual offenses team, did lots and lots of things, did some critical incident management, which is all about the 24 hour emergency response stuff that we get, the 999 calls. And I just loved my career, absolutely loved my career. And then it came to the point where I was thinking, I want to have my own business and I want to work in this equality and diversity field because I just recognised that if there was a need within the police for this kind of work, there must be a need within other organisations as well. So um, when I left the police, I did set up my own business um, and that wasn't easy because I'm not a business person. I don't know people who own businesses nobody in my family owns a business or anything like that and I was thinking I don't even know where to start I really didn't but I looked and I went and checked out who I could get advice from where I could go to get advice where I could go to get support because as much as I knew what I wanted to do I didn't know how to go about setting up a business and then putting myself out there and offering my services so um, I went to an organization uh, called the women's organization who actually help women set up in business that's what they're there for they support them they give them courses they give them a business advisor they get help with putting a, um, a business plan together and all that kind of stuff and it was just absolutely invaluable for me I went on went to the women's organization I got myself a business advisor I did the courses around doing business planning tax and you know um national insurance bookkeeping social media marketing and all that kind of stuff that you need to get yourself started and they were so supportive and so so helpful and they had a massive network of other women entrepreneurs that you could meet with because they held social events and things and um, I was able to speak at some of those events as well and talk talk about my story and 
from there, I was able to set up my business and I set it up maybe, I think it was just over four years ago. And I was really proud, really proud of the fact that I'm now a businesswoman. Wow, who'd ever thought, you know, a little black girl from Toxic would ever be a businesswoman. So there I am with my business. And the hard work is in the first two years. It really is because you've got to get your reputation built. You've got to get yourself known. You know, you've got to sort of build that positive reputation. So I did a lot of um, free work, you know, sort of people asking me to come and do motivational talks. So I'd go and do motivational talks. I'd go and do a couple of workshops with people just to build that um, background and to build that experience. And also just to, to build your networks. There was so much networking. I was networking sort of four and five times a week, going to different events, because that's what you need to do to get yourself known, to link in with other people, link in with other businesses, link in with other potential customers who may be able to or may want to buy your services. So the first two years was really hard and really challenging. And I have to say, I very, very nearly gave up on it when I thought it's just not happening I'm just not getting any paid working and I did think maybe I should just go and get a job because this is not going to work and then all of a sudden it started turning around and the work started coming in people who'd see me doing talks on at various events people who'd heard about me you know I did a TEDx talk and people started to think you know, God, we want her in, we want to bring her into our organisation. So I was doing lots of coaching, one-to-one -one coaching. I was doing coaching, uh, business coaching within organisations. I was delivering workshops around equality and diversity, which was what my passion was, and around unconscious bias and positions of privilege and under understanding how unconscious bias manifests in the workplace and microaggressions and things like that. I was talking to staff, all minority staff, training minority staff in um, assertiveness and confidence and in resilience and overcoming barriers so that they could strive for what they wanted and the wonderful thing for me was to see people grow and to see people grow in confidence and to start to go for the things that they really wanted to go for and really reach their potential instead of feeling like oh I can't do that or oh, you know, I don't see anybody who looks like me doing that be the first I mean I was the first and I didn't know who was the best, but, you know, just go for what you want. I had a very clear ambition and I went for my ambition and it did take a lot of hard work. And, and I had knockbacks as well. It wasn't just plain sailing. I had plenty of knockbacks too when I was when I was going through the promotion process, you know, not passing interviews in the interview process on, on a couple of occasions. And yeah, it does dent your confidence. And yet it does make you think, oh, maybe I'm just not good enough or maybe I haven't got the skills and stuff. But you've just got to believe in yourself. And it's all about believing in yourself and knowing what your strengths are and knowing what you're capable of. And you won't know what you're capable of unless you try. So you just got to keep trying and trying and trying, putting yourself out there, putting yourself out there, taking the knocks because through the knocks and the mistakes that you make, that's how you learn. That's how I learned. You know, by making mistakes and even in business, being a businesswoman, I've made lots of mistakes. But you learn from them and that's how you grow, you know, because nobody's perfect. Nobody knows everything. Life is a lifelong learning journey, you know, so we're learning something all the time. And that's the way it should be. So just learn from your mistakes and just keep going. Because the most important thing is believing in yourself and believing what you're capable of and pushing yourself. Because it does take work and it does, you know... It is, <laughs> it's a journey, uh, but it can be a fun journey. And I've had fun along the way, as well as the knocks. I've had lots of fun. I've had lots of laughs, you know, and I've met some amazing, fantastic people along the way, you know, throughout all my careers, from, from the council, from the police, and now in business, you know, I've got such a massive network now. And I love it. I love it. I love being able to support people. I love being able to put people in touch with people who can support others. You know, and that's what it's about. It's about giving back. And, you know, with all the wealth of experience that I've been able to amass through all my different careers, I like to give a bit back. And that's what I do. So I do a bit of volunteering work as well um, in the police as a chaplain. And that's not all about religion. It can be, but it's not all about that. It's about being a listening ear. People who are struggling maybe with stress, 
you know, maybe having family problems, maybe having problems with the children. And I just provide a confidential listening gear service for staff. So I only go in once a week for a couple of hours, have a chat to the frontline staff. If anybody's struggling and wants to have a conversation, we can go off and have a private conversation and I can talk them through any issues that they've got. But I just love giving back. And yeah, I do, I've done a bit of volunteering work for the, for the Girls Network, you know, Row and love to see people be supported and I also love to help people along their path and empower people along their path so that's me that's a uh, yeah a bit about my journey and um oh I forgot to say I'm a mum as well <laughs> I've got a 13 year old son um and he's wonderful absolutely amazing I love playing rugby as well touch rugby not full contact rugby because I'm a bit too old for that but touch rugby real great for fitness and a real great social environment and camaraderie so if you if you want to get into a sport yeah women's rugby is a great sport to get. Way to go. <laughs> so that's me so if there are any questions I'm happy to take questions oh brilliant oh there you go um I mean I can read it out for you um have you got any advice for dealing with sexism in a male dominant environment slash workplace really wow that, that's a great question and you know working in the in the police environment there was a lot of sexism a lot of sexism because it is a male dominated environment at first when you're new to an organization you do feel as if you've got to keep your head down and just like because it just get on with things and try to ignore it and try to just you know brush it away and brush it under the carpet but you keep doing that and then it just keeps carrying on and carrying on and carrying on. And people don't learn that it's not the right thing to do. It's the wrong thing to do. And it can be difficult when you're surrounded by men because it's couched in banter, isn't it? It's just a bit of a joke. It's just a bit of a laugh. Why are you being too sensitive? You know, and all that kind of thing. But for me, it's about saying, well, it's, it might be a laugh and a joke for you, but I'm not laughing and I don't find it funny. I actually find it insulting. So I'd appreciate it if you stopped. If you stand up to people and you make your views clear, then it will start to diminish and people start to think, oh, actually, mm, yeah, maybe you can't do that. And also seek allies in other people who are prepared to stand up as well and to say, no, that's not acceptable. No, that's not funny. And no, not, uh, not dealing with that. So it's always good to challenge it. And if you don't feel as if you can challenge it yourself because maybe you're new to an organization or you just don't feel confident enough to challenge it, then go to a supervisor or a line manager or a colleague and just say, listen, you know, I'm not happy about this, you know, and, you know, can you say something about it or could you, could you help me to challenge it or, you know, take it to a supervisor and, you know, report it to a supervisor. You're well within your rights to do that because you do not have to be on the receiving end of sexism in the workplace. And in this day and age, people know it's wrong. So if people are doing it, if men are perpetrating it, then stand up to them because you will get plenty of support. Lovely. Um, I've got a question as well, and Hannah, if you've got any more, honestly, just throw them over. Um, but did you ever um like hit like a bit of a turning point where you obviously because um going through your career, you can, it's kind of like like you just keep going type of thing. Um, was there a point where you kind of hit and you went, I'm actually making quite a bit of a difference here, like almost a bit like a reality check to an extent. Um, I mean, the thing is, when you're working in an environment like the police, you just get on with the job, you know, you get on with the job, you, you, you're being bounced from job to job because it's really, really, really busy. But yeah, I think the time when I felt I was really making a big difference, where it really came home to me and I had a chance to sit back and reflect on it, was when I worked in the Specialist Child Protection Unit um, as a constable and we investigated like um, child abuse cases sounds awful sounds horrible and and they were there were some really really horrible cases that we dealt with but seeing being able to save those children and get those children out of those difficult situations and putting the offender behind bars was the greatest satisfaction and the, you know the gratitude of the families when they when you know they got the justice was just wonderful really really rewarding so that was a big big massive um, kind of 
yeah, um, sense of satisfaction um, from that, that, that line of work, but also the community engagement work as well. When I went into the black community and I talked to the black community about a career in the police, and because, you know, there's lots of bad feeling. The legacy of the riots lives on because it's passed on from generation to generation. But it was about having that honest conversations and saying, yeah, yeah, there are racists in the police. Yeah, you probably will get racist abuse. You probably will struggle. You probably may not get the same opportunities as your white, co as your white colleagues. But unless you join, we can't make a difference and we can't change it. And it's about being honest about police making mistakes as well, because when people hear about the honesty of it and it's not all wonderful and guns and noses, then the more the, the happier to join because there's honesty, there's openness, that they're being told the real truth and not being sold a rosy dream, you know. So for me, it's about honesty, brutal honesty. Yes, we get it wrong. Yes, there's disproportionality in stop searches. Yes, black people do get a rougher deal, but you've got to you've got to work through that and navigate through that and try and bring in more diversity to try and challenge those things 100 percent. i mean i completely agree as well in terms of it's so scary i can imagine like um being almost like the first type of step but um if you look at like the history in terms of like um feminism and like lgbtq plus like communities like st standing up for the right sim riots and like jumping in front of the king's horse like all like it's so scary like i mean you couldn't imagine how they were feeling but like it just takes like a little bit of like a step for like everyone with the same views to kind of go oh my god yeah like we need to keep going with this because then I mean obviously we've got so much work to do in terms of racism like homophobia like everything still got so much to do but it's like we're on like the right path we've still got so much to do don't get me wrong but like we are definitely better than even like 10 years ago like it's mad but Definitely, I agree more. Absolutely, and I think for me, you know, the great hope with the, the younger generation now is that the, they are a lot more diverse. They do mix a lot more than the, certainly from the generation that I come from. You know, I worked with police officers who said they'd never met a black person before, and you're like, what? <laughs> what do you want? Where do you live? You yeah. know, and that kind of thing. But the younger generation, there's so much more diversity. There's so much more mixing. There's so much more acceptance. And it just gives me great hope, you know, that your generation are gonna make the difference because you recognize, you no, know, sexism's not happening. No, we're not having racism. We're not having homophobia. We're not having all this is all these isms. We mm -hmm. wanna just accept and be accepted for who and what we are. And I think there's gonna be a huge sea change because young people now are a lot more vociferous. You know, the, the, the social media has given a platform for people to be able to air the views, some negative, but, but lots of positive. You know, and there's, there's the strength in numbers as well, you know, when you have a, a network behind you and a cohort behind you, the strength in that, because you're never on your own when you're talking about and calling out these types of behaviours, because there'll always be someone who's on your side and support you, and more and more so in this day and age, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement has brought out so many allies in terms of, you know, the, 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 um, the race fight, if you like there's so many allies and it was just wonderful to see you know white people black people brown people standing shoulder to shoulder to say no this can't go on and that was so uplifting it was so wonderful to see and that's your generation your generation are doing that so I've got loads and loads of hope for things changing in the future so yeah. take your hands you Hannah you as well <laughs> both your hands Eva and Anna Hannah so let's make a difference make it happen mm -hmm. um definitely in the last year i think racism had there's definitely been a much more of a sprint i think in terms of since george floyd um have you been involved in anything obviously because you're quite like an icon i'm gonna call yeah in like liverpool and um, like you are very but like you're a very good spokesperson for the black community in liverpool um especially because you're a true scouser i mean it helps um but yeah have you been kind of like involved like you know obviously it, it's always been here but in the last year i think especially because there were marches worldwide over george floyd and yeah. like Obviously, there, there were marches before, but I think that was a huge shock almost to everyone. I mean, um, 
Yeah, so were you like involved within the past year? Have you been doing much? Or? Well, I have, but not not on marches and things like that yeah. because you know I don't. I wasn't comfortable going on marches because of the COVID situation and things, and I've got vulnerable family members that I'm having contact with. So I wasn't going to put myself at risk in that way. And um, certainly supported the, the, the marches through, you know, social media and things like that. But the way I do my work and how I support the Black Lives Matter movement is through the, bit, the work that I do with my business, because it's all about challenging um, equality and diversity within the workplace and in gender and uh, an environment of equality and diversity and inclusion within the workplace so getting organizations to look at the strategies getting organizations to look at how inclusive their organizations are looking at the recruitment processes where are they recruiting from how are they getting into the black community how are they recognizing talent from black people and doing that kind of work and changing the, the environment for black people so that they can get into these jobs and that the, you know, the, the job market is opened up for them and supporting people within those organisations as well to thrive and to grow. And it's a lot of the workshops I've done with organisations and some really large multi, multi, multicultural global organisations is about getting the message home to them about allyship okay, it's great to have allyship when you're, you know, you're out and about and you see someone maybe being you know, abused in some way when you're out and about. What are you doing about your staff? What are you doing about your colleagues? You know, what are you doing about supporting your colleagues who are suffering, who are being discriminated against or who are being on the receiving end of microaggressions? What are you doing for them? And that's all about allyship, standing by them. So we do an allyship um, workshop about how to be a true ally and what you need to do to stand up and be an ally. So for me, it's about that education piece and also supporting um, black, black workers within the workplace to develop the resilience and to build their confidence and to build their assertiveness. So for me, that's my work for the Black Lives Matter movement is standing in organisations, challenging organisations and standing with staff in a coaching uh, capacity. And um, thank you so much for all what you do because yeah, it's it's really enlightening. And um, Hannah, if you haven't got any more questions, I don't either. Um, so I think we're all we're all done. If that's unless you've got any more to say. No, I just want to just say, you know, you young people are the way forward, and I'm so excited to see the change you're going to make for our organ for our world, really, because you know there's so much passion that I see in, in young people now, you know, finding the voice and doing the marches and standing up, you know, for environmental issues and for all this stuff. And it's just really exciting because when I was your age, I would probably would have been like, hmm, I can't do anything like that. I don't have a clue what to do. You know? I don't want to keep my head down and get on with, me, with my life. But people have got passion for change and passion for the future. And that is so wonderful to see. So you guys keep up the good work. 